construction of non categorical categorical continuous theories, groupoids, column functions, and allylic plan. As, as yesterday, I suggest if you ask a question during a talk, just put your video on. Thanks. Thanks, Itai. Okay, um, so first of all, I, I hope you hear me. If there is any problem, any, okay, let me move something away from the microphone. Okay, this should be better. So I hope you can hear me well. And in any case, I thank you for allowing me to speak at this conference. I must apologize. I mean, I, I, I cannot be there and therefore it's this Zoom talk. I don't see very well the audience. It's probably going to go very badly. I have absolutely no experience in giving such talks. So apologies in advance. Anyhow, um, so I'm going to hopefully give speak for the last time, at least on this project. So it's a project I've been kind of working on for on and off for, for the last, for a while now. And it's somehow presented uh, me with a few surprises. So maybe, maybe let me talk about, so it's going to be about continuous logic as many would have expected anyway. Um, so let, let me just give a quick, 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 I mean, by no means am I going to actually define or construct continuous logic, but let's just very briefly remind you that, well, continuous first order logic is something that is too Boolean first order logic, what most people just call first order logic, as say a compact interval would be to the two value set true and false. So structures would be, uh, so, so, so distance, the real value distance replaces the Boolean value inequality. Structures are then metric structures, they are bounded, uh, complete, that's kind of a technicality, and formulas are real valued, and they're going to be uniformly continuous with respect to the distance and bounded because okay, values are in a compact set. And connectives are continuous, and then we have quantifiers. So instead of for all there exists, we have sub and if. And somehow the point is that this is, I mean, it looks similar but different, but in fact, it's, it's an extension because you can put all of standard Boolean uh, model theory inside continuous model theory just by considering zero one valued structures. And I always get somebody to get angry at me for this, but zero is true, one is false. And that's not very important. Anyhow, so, in many aspects, uh, just doing abstract continuous model theory, so just de developing I know, general stuff, basically consists of, okay, let's see what we have in classical model theory, uh, when we expect to have similar things, and, and then sometimes it just goes so smoothly, we get bored, and sometimes we get some surprises. So maybe, for example, the start with a few easy things, so compactness theorem via Walsh theorem and levenheim scholem up and down, stability, if not stability stated correctly, Morley's theorem stated correctly, they all go through no problem. Okay, in some cases you need to work a bit more. Um, strongly minimal sets, uh, okay, so basically finding strongly minimal sets in the naive sense in Aleph not stable theory. Okay, that doesn't work. So th there are around some other works. I, okay, I need still to be convinced about them, but in any case, there are prob definitely problems. So doing the baldwin lachlan uh, statement of Morley theorem, that's definitely uh, a problem. Okay, let's go in another direction. Uh, omitting type theorem, again, st stated correctly, it's, a, it's essentially go through as is. Rilnadzewski theorem goes through as is, again, when phrased correctly. I guess I should call it in that context, Rilnadzewski Hansen. Uh, and so you get to Aleph not categorical structures and you get to Aleph not categorical reconstruction. So that's uh, in classical logic uh, that was proved by Cocon. Uh, published by Albert and Ziegler, as far as I can understand the history, it's kind of references are not Italic here. And, uh, and that was generalized to continuous logic, again, without much problems. And then the things that just don't work, for example, the no two model theorem, I mean, that's just, I mean, I, 
very easy to give an example of a continuous series that has exactly two separable models. So, okay, so something go, something that, okay, that's not some surprises. So here's a different kind of surprise, um, it's column functions. Okay, it's column functions, just forget about it. The, you, you, doing like adding column functions to the language is not something to, that's going to work because you would need to choose witnesses uniformly continuously and there's just absolutely no way you're going to always be able to, to do that. It's just, Forget about just adding this column functions to the language. And, and somehow um, collateral damage from that is that you have problem with uh, reconstruction of non-Aleph not categorical theories. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So there is some funny surprise. In the end, it does go through quite well, but okay, there is a surprise that that's different from other surprises I had seen before, before that. Okay, so maybe uh, let's recall the, the classical result. Um, so take an Aleph not categorical theory in, uh, in a sorry, complete, in a countable language, take its uh, well, unique countable or separable model, take its automorphism group. So that's an invariant of the theory as a topological group with, top, with pointwise convergence. It's a Polish group. And it is a complete by interpretation invariant for the theory. That is to say that if you have another theory that's also Aleph not categorical, then they have the same associated automorphism groups as topological groups, if and only if they are bi-interpretable. So one direction is kind of easy and the other direction is, okay, something needs to be done, but okay, it's a thing. Uh, so that was proved by Coquin uh, and, and for continuous logic uh, by a student of mine, okay, in collaboration with a student of mine, Adrien Peixot. Um, okay, so that's the reason that, hmm? uh, when you say same, what is the topology in the case of continuous logic? Is it uh, pointwise convergence? Yes, okay. pointwise convergence, so, so, same thing. And pointwise convergence on the structure or pointwise convergence restricted to a dense countable subset is the same thing. So really, no, it's, there is no problem there. And, and I'm going to present the topology in a slightly different way in a second. Um, so, Okay, and there is a more over that actually I'm not going to going to be able to generalize today, which is uh, the characterization of groups of this form. So these are the Polish Rolkopy compact groups for continuous logic and a restricted class of those uh, for classical logic, for Boolean logic, and what I call, I call these things reconstruction because you actually have an explicit of how the, 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 the one of the implications is, is based on the fact that from the group, you can actually explicitly reconstruct a theory that's by interpretable with your original one. So it determines the by interpretation. So, so at some point a few years ago, I was uh, highly interested in consequences of this because it really was the beginning of a very nice, well, I guess I still am, uh, a nice program which says basically the following. If Aleph not categorical model theory is the same thing as, well, basically Rocco pre-compact Polish groups, well, then that gives you a very intimate connection between the two areas, and, it, and this actually goes in two directions. So, uh, so in in some sense, you can uh, subject those uh, relatively compact Polish groups, which are non very non locally compact groups, uh, some of which are actually very much of interest to guys doing just dynamics. Okay, such groups such as the I don't, un, unitary groups, infinite unitary, the infinite dimensional unitary groups, and such. Uh, and you can subject them to model theoretic treatment. I think the most uh, impressive instance of that was uh, Iba Lucia's proof uh, of that rotary compact Polish groups simply have, all of them have property T. 
Uh, in the other direction, um, well, again, Le Balboussia actually reproved this annoying theorem <laughs> that somehow annoyed many, I mean, it's, it's proof annoyed many people that uh, NIP is preserved under, uh, under uh, Kiesler randomization. Not, not very important if you don't know what it is, not very important. Uh, the point is that basically he translates it to a question about dynamics in that group and then shows that, well, ran randomization preserves those dynamical properties and then goes back. So it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful argument, very different from the proof of the main theorem. The, the, the general theorem actually, but the point is that this works only for uh, Aleph not categorical theories. Uh, so there the theorem actually holds for uh, all, the, the original theorem holds for all theories. So it's kind of disappointing. This, this whole thing only works from uh, our point of view to uh, only applies to Aleph not categorical theories. So I guess that's the origin of trying to see what can be done for non aleph not categorical theories. So you would, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going to do a fast forward. And, and, and in the end, what you realize is that you need to deal with groupoids of isomorphism between countable models. Okay, that's not very surprising. And okay, there's some things you want these groupoids to satisfy. And so let, let, let's fast forward to, to the recent result about that. Okay, so well, first of all, let me remind you, probably know that, but a groupoid, okay, usually, I mean, there are two ways of stating this and it's probably maybe not the way you are used to, but let's say this way. A groupoid is a set equipped with partial composition law and total inversion law. So, and then there are some axioms. So think of all isomorphisms in a small category, you can invert them and you can compose them if the target and source match. So it's a partial composition law. And I can recognize it's um, the objects uh, of the category because, well, an isomorphism is equal to its square if and only if it's the identity of some object. Well, so that allows you to identify the objects as a set of all identity maps, and it's a subset of G. And then if you have a morphism, an isomorphism, sorry, you can find its source object and its target object well, basically by composing it with its inverse one way or the other. Okay, and it's a group if and only if the, the, the base is there's a set of idempotents is a singleton. So it's a groupoid over a single point. Okay, and then you make it a, a topological groupoid by uh, asking the maps to be continuous. And there is this technical twist that you, in a group, the composition law is always open in a topology group, a composition law is always open in a group where that's no longer the case. So let's add that as a hypothesis. It's open. I, 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 won't, I, won't, I want the, 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 the composition law to be an open map. That's the same as saying that the source or the target map are, are open. open maps to the, to the basis. Okay. So let me just state the theorem. Uh, well, I mean, a theorem. It's not yet what I'm going to do, talk about. Today. I've mentioned this theorem already in the past. So to every theory uh, in Boolean logic for the time being, so I can associate a topological groupoid. It's Polish. It's open. Did I say that? I didn't say that. Okay, it's a Polish open groupoid, and its basis is the Cantor set. So it's very elegant. And it's a complete by interpretation invariant for T. That means that from, uh, in fact, from uh, this groupoid, I can actually reconstruct quite explicitly a theory that is by interpretable with T. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this. Well, I'm going to go into one detail of this. So, okay. I just, uh, it, I, Boolean yeah. logic means two variants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Boolean, just classical. I don't know. I just feel that maybe Boolean is more uh, informative than classical. True, false, just standard logic, whatever yeah, you I usually want... think of as logic. Discrete. Okay, fine. Yeah. Well, okay, yes. I don't know. Discrete, Boolean, whatever. All these, that was synonymous. Yeah. So, in order to, to do this, really, the, the, the main obstacle is just to construct. Uh, to find the right way to construct this groupoid. So maybe let's, before doing that, let me present a different way of constructing the group 
in the case where the theory is Aleph not pedagogical. So you have a model. Actually, this construction works also if it's not Aleph not pedagogical, if I just want to construct the automorphism group of the structure, but let's say it's a, it's a unique separate, whatever. Okay, so you, 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 you fix an enumeration, it's a countable model, you fix an enumeration, so it's an infinite tuple. And you might, might say that it codes M in the sense that it has the same DCL as M, just an enumeration of M. And then the automorphism group of M is as a topological space, the same thing as the set of all types of A and the copy of A, so A and B have the same type, which have the same DCL. In other words, all ways of enumerating M, the same M um, with the same type, but possibly in other enumerations. Well, how, how is that? Well, I mean, the embedding is quite obvious. If I have an automorphism, I just apply it to A and I get two copies of A that enumerate the same model. Okay, but they're not the same enumeration. And think of it, of it a little, uh, it's the same topology also, because once you fix the type of A and the type of B, all that's left is to say which members of A are equal to which members of B and vice versa. And that's exactly the point why convergence topology on auto that. And the group law is, well, take two such types. You might as well assume that the second of the first is the first of the second, and then you can compose. Okay. So it's odd to state things this way, but very convenient because now I can say, okay, now suppose I managed to find in a non aleph not categorical setting, a good set of codes for models. So what do I mean by good? Leave that aside for a second. What do I mean by codes? Basically enumerations or the DCL of the code should be the model or something like that. Okay, so I get the topological groupoid by, by taking, again, exactly the same thing. I take all types of two codes for the same model. And well, that's it basically. Uh, and I compose them by taking, well, if I have two such types and the second of the first is the first of the second and they compose and, and if, and, and okay, so now if you have just two types, either the, the, the types agree, the type of the second of the first and the type of the second agree, and then you can just make them to be the same element or they don't agree. Well, and then composition just is not defined. Okay, but it's a group point, that's fine. And, and so what's the basis? What are the um, objects? Well, wh which are the idempotent? Which are the identity maps? The one that send A back to itself. So you might as well identify type AA with just the type of A. So it's a set of all types in, or, or in D. Okay. Uh, if this is type definable, in particular, this is a compact set. Uh, okay, so this is a generalization of the of the of the previous case. Well, provided we find D. Okay, so for now on Wait, the so case. Sorry, it's I want yeah. topology. Sorry, what topology do you take? It's a space of types. It's a set of types. Okay, but this condition about DCL is not a closed condition the way it's written. No, it's not. It's a G delta condition. Yeah, fine. Okay. It's, it's going to be a poly, it's going to be a Polish space. It's not going to be a compact space. I mean, you don't expect it. It's a it's a Polish space. Fine, fine. Yeah. I, I think I actually wrote it, but maybe at the later point. Okay. So, oh, I'm advancing way too quickly. Okay, I need to that. Okay, let's let's see. So, so how do you find this set D? Okay. Now, now again is find a nice set of codes for models. So say I have a sequence of formulas. So the formulas are always going to be in n plus one variables. So the nth formula is going to take n plus one variables. And the, it, it says that for every way of choosing the first, so it is true that for any possible choice of the first n variables, you can find a witness put it in the last variable and the formula holds. Uh, 
Um, and if you have a formula that doesn't satisfy it, you could just do an easy manipulation to make it. So you might as well, as well assume that all of, you only consider formulas that satisfy this property. Okay, and you take a sequence of those. <clears throat> and now you can define a set of infinite tuples by the following condition. So an infinite sequence belongs to your set. <clears throat> if um, for every formula, well, every formula holds. Basically, what it means that every uh, a n is always the witness is always a witness for the formula with parameters. Uh, well, everything that came before that. Um, so now, if you chose your sequence richly enough, you have the set of the set of the a is 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 satisfy the task that condition. So every A will enumerate a model. Uh, sorry, Itai. Yes. What is, in, in the definition, you have an M. M is, M is supposed to be a fixed model or what? M? What is M? M. M. Oh, no, no, yeah. it's just a way of saying the home sort. Sorry, oh, the home, M is the home sort. Yeah, I, I, it's true that it's not. I mean, basically, you should read as D phi of M is going to be a sub a set of infinite sequences in M. Basically, the home sort. Sorry, I know, you're right. Uh, sorry, did you want to be slowed down? I can slow you down with another question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, previously you said that you don't mind having G deltas. But now it kind of looks like you're seeking to compactify the set of models. So why, why do you need to do it? Why can't you just say, I mean, the set of models is a G delta and that's it. Okay, let me go back. The group is going to be G delta. I, the group is going to be Polish. I have no problem with that. I really want the basis to be compact. Ah, okay, okay. So okay. I want D to be type definable. The group, even if D is type definable, the group is not going to be compact. But I want the basic, okay. But I want to be, okay, so, okay. Now, uh, I, can I can leave, if, if it's rich enough, then enough many phi ends are just true. And that gives you wiggle room to add elements. So every countable model is enumerated by a member of this set. So basically it's just a set of codes for all models. So this is a set, this is a set of codes for models. You're right. I mean, it is a type definable set in infinitely many variables, but it's actually better than that. So- Entire question? Yes. When you say valid, you mean in the theory that you're working with, not valid in the whole logic. Are it you, can be valid in the whole logic. It can be valid in the whole logic. But we can just replace, just take your any odd formula and replace it with either it holds, either there is no witness or the formula holds. And, and you get a formula that's, that's, that satisfies my condition. It, it, it's, it's something that you can do uniformly regardless of the ambient theory. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and next one, I'm going to do it in continuous logic is going to be something similar. And again, the same manipulation will hold. So maybe if, let's see if I can write something. So you can always replace phi of x, x, y with uh, either phi, I mean, phi of x, y or uh, that does not exist y phi, um, no, well, phi of x, y, I guess that's bad. Let's call it z. Okay. And, and, and this one satisfies the condition. And if phi already satisfies the condition, then, then you didn't change phi. So this is some manipulation that's very convenient. Okay. But let, let me go back to properties of this nice set D. So it's really nice because it is definable. Okay, so it's definable in the sense of continuous logic, but we are doing classical logic. So that's probably not the best way to say this. Uh, a different way to say this was exactly the same property was, I think, Udi didn't, and, and Francois, didn't you call this strictly pro-definable? I believe so. Uh, and that basically means that when you project it to finitely many coordinates, you get a definable set. For example, projected to the first n coordinates, and it's just defined by uh, requiring the first n guys to be witnesses. And that's the projection because you can always uh, choose subsequent guys because they always are witnesses. So it is indeed 
uh, this is indeed the projection of the phi to the first end coordinates, and it is a definable set because there are only finitely many formulas involved here. And this plays a very important role. I'm kind of difficult to explain without going into technicalities why this is so crucial, but it just turns out to be, um, well, okay, very useful. I mean, it's useful for showing, for example, that the groupoid is, is, uh, is open. Oh, but now there is a problem because uh, now I depend on an extra parameter on this set or on this sequence of formulas. So, okay, so let's just accept it as a black box. Uh, if I have two rich sequences of formulas, then there is a definable bijection between the corresponding sets of codes for models. So there is really just one canonical set of codes for models uh, for T. Uh, and now I define the groupoid for that set. So just groupoid for T is a groupoid for T in that set. So it's all types of pairs of codes for models under this representation, but any other representation is isomorphic to it. Well, that code the same. And the basis would be all types of a single member of this set. And since it is compact, you have CC time family, it's compacted. And actually, you can check that it is the Cantor set. Um, OK. And it's a Polish because equality of DCL is G delta. And it's open because of the definability of this set. So now I can, uh, now I actually defined kind of, well, actually, yes, no, I have defined the groupoid G of T and I can state the theorem more precisely. This groupoid is a complete by interpretation invariant for T. And I can reconstruct T up to my interpretation uh, from, from it. Okay, cool. So what's it like? Okay, next. Well, I mean, I started with saying, okay, we do things in classical logic, in Boolean logic, and then we generalize it to continuous logic. So let's do it. So let's recall. Hey, hey, the okay, can, can I still slow you down for a second before you go to continuous logic? Can you say what is the image? Can you characterize the image of uh, this map? Which map? That takes a theory to G of T. Ah, no, no. I, as I said, I'm, I, I have a few. Uh, I mean, okay, that's the one part of, uh, I mean, the, the, Okay, I mean, in the, the short answer is no. There okay. is a longer answer than that, but the short answer is no. It's more, it's way more complicated. I also have a question. Um, so uh, when you say reconstruct, what, what explicitly reconstruct? What, what do you mean? Like it's a recursive thing or effective? Uh, um, it means that I can tell you. I mean, there's going to be lots of clope and subsets of GT. I can tell you which clope and subsets. Are uh, correspond to formulas. Um, sorts of T correspond to clope and subgroupoids. I, I can tell you which are the sorts, the imaginary sorts of T, which are the formulas on those imaginary sorts. I, rec I reconstruct the language, but without any identified home sort. Anyhow, it's already not trivial. I just tell you how to construct the theory, the, uh, how to reconstruct T. Explicit in that sense. It's, it's not a magic that if they are equal, they are equal. If they are distinct, they are distinct. I actually tell you how to construct something that's by interpretable with T. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. One, one more thing mm. um, from the previous slide. Could you repeat what rich means in, in the statement of the proposition? It just means that every, I, I never stated it, so I cannot restate it, but uh, basically it tells you that every formula appears uh, somewhere and even infinitely many amount, infinitely many times. But you thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, okay, so what did we say? We said, okay, we assume that there are all, we, we have a sequence of formulas. Each time we know in advance that it's going to be a witness. And then we say the sequence where each one is a witness. And okay, I mean, it's very nice. This should work in continuous logic, right? Okay, then you do this. And then the, the extension to continuous logic, you just give to one of your grad students and, 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 and hope for the best. Okay, uh, the best is not going to come. 
Uh, and there is a problem. I mean, the, the big problem is, I mean, there is an odd phenomenon and it starts to, and, and this problem with uh, scholar function is uh, starting to annoy you because, well, when, when there always, ex when you know that there always exists a witness, well, then you have uh, a set of, um, basically you have a family of uh, witnesses, it projects onto the family of parameters because for every parameter there exists a witness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay, I mean, I'm saying trivialities basically regarding Boolean logic, but the point is that all these trivialities fail when we switch to continuous logic. So, so what would be the analogous hypothesis? The analogous hypothesis would be something like the infimum is equal, always equal to zero regardless of X. But that does not mean that in a non-saturated model, you actually have somebody that gives you the value zero. Maybe it's, they just have guys where the value is arbitrarily small, but none where the value is zero. That's possible. So, so the projection need not be onto. Oh, and, and also, well, I haven't defined what it actually means to be a definable set in continuous logic, but let me tell you, this set need not be a definable set. And everything I've done so far collapses. Uh, and, and, and basically, you, you're not going to be able to prove the, all the argument that attempt to prove uh, uniqueness. If you try to define in this way, OK, just, just a mess, not that's called more. It, it's a mess, it's bad, it's not good. Don't do this, it doesn't work. OK, so I don't remember if I've already spoken about this uh, and where, but I actually had some kind of solution for this. But it was a cheating solution. So just basically pretend, in some sense, pretend that there is no problem. Um, so the pretend no, there is no problem is basically, let's assume that even in a continuous theory, you have a sort, basically a definable set, an interpretable sort, a definable set that is like that uh, D phi uh, we define in Boolean logic. So what do I mean by, I'm not going to give the precise definition, it's kind of technical, um, but morally what it says is you can easily construct definable scholar functions from this. So if you have a formula on D and some other sort and you look for witnesses, you can get them definably. I mean, that's definitely something that was true for DP because it contained all the witnesses and you knew where to look for the witnesses. So the, the fact that I know where to look for the witnesses, it's not only, to get compactness, it's also a good thing if I want to construct sco definable scholar functions. The witness, well, yeah, it's there. It's the 1,557th element. That's, that's going to be the witness, I know. Okay, so something like that. Okay, the actual definition is a bit technical. Let's just ignore it. The point is that in some sense, the definition, at least in the beginning, was really given in a way to imit to allow me to imitate the proof of uniqueness of DFI. So that goes through. If D admits two such sorts, then there is a definable bijection between them. Okay, so now assume that it does. But it doesn't tell you anything about existing, just uniqueness. So assume that there is such a thing. Well, then each one, each member of this guy codes models, so every member is DCL equivalent to some model. All models are, all separate models are DCL equivalent to some guy, I guess I'm, I didn't write it, but it's the same. So it's, you code models, you code all separate models. And the associate topological groupoid, well, it's unique because, it, because this set, if it exists, it's unique. And it is a by interpretation invariant. So again, assume such a sort D exists, take all types of pairs A, B that have the same DCL that code this same model with the induced topology from the type space, that's going to give you an open Polish groupoid, topological groupoid, and, um, and it's going to be a complete by interpretation invariant for T. And just as we happened in classical logic, the space of types in D is a counter set. Okay, and that already looks suspicious. I mean, you don't expect to find counter sets in continuous logic, or do you? I mean, it's okay, it sounds, at, at the very least, it sounds restrictive. So, how restrictive is this? 
Um, okay, I guess I just re repeated the theorem for context. Okay, so if T is Boolean, it's classical logic, then such a, uh, a universal column sort exists. We have, we have constructed one. I mean, that was the model uh, for, for the definition. Okay, that's the case already covered. Now, if T is Aleph not categorical, then also a universal column sort exists. It's actually a very stupid construction. I take a model, I take its complete type. So basically I take all copies of the model. So that's, a, it's a type definable set, but we are alpha not categorical. Type definable equals definable by Rinaldzewski. So it's a definable set. I multiply it with the Cantor space. That's still a definable set. And this is a universal scholar sort. And of course the type space, because everybody, everybody in D0 has the same type, the type space here is just the Cantor set. And okay, and you can, okay, actually these details, I'm going to go back to them in a second. So maybe it's a bit too early, but, but so I cover Boolean theories. I cover Aleph not. It, it, I, um, is A a finite tuple here in the Aleph zero category? No, 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 no. Oh, oh, there is no, it doesn't, it's, it's an interpretable sort and in continuous logic, infinite, infinite tuples are also an interpretable sort. So in some sense, the question is not, uh, is meaningless. I mean, it could be, I, think hyper-imaginary thought, thought, okay? It could be infinite. Itai, I mean, one more question. What yes. question, Itai? Yes. Uh, a, this tuple A is supposed to uh, be the be a model, right? It's supposed to be the tuple, be a numerator model. Kind of, yeah, kind of. So, but then DCLA is, is itself, DCLA equals A. No, it's, so I'm telling you, it's not necessarily, so in this case, this is some more of an axiomatic approach. It's not an enumeration of a model. It's just some code that's DCL equivalent to a model. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, in this case, sorry, 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 sorry. In the Aleph categorical case, yes, yes, yes. It's an enumeration of the model or then subset and yes. So it's DCL is the model and and, and, and the compact uh, set is in the, in the DCL of the empty set, so it doesn't add any. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just confused the whole, I, I mean, in, in, when you started off about yes. the D at the very beginning, isn't it the tuples A, B, which satisfy this, the same type, same type or something, and, and one is, and, and, they're, and they're, they each can be, each can be re-enumerated as the other, is that, is that? Yes. Yes, yeah. So up to enumeration of the same tuple, up to re-enumeration of the same tuple. Yes. Yeah, okay. And, and just what I do here is I decorate them with the member of the Cantor space. Okay, okay. So, so for the, from the group point of view, it's basically, it just think of it as taking an object. If you take an object in its automorphism group and now you decorate, you allow it, you start to decorate it with the point uh, of the Cantor set. So now an, an isomorphism of the new category is, well, it's an automorphism of that object, but you need to tell from which copy to which copy. So it's this counter sets times the group times the counter set, and you only allowed to compose when you are compatible on this decoration. Anyway, I also mentioned another result, uh, just, which is not covered by the first two and which is interesting because of the relation with uh, hopeful relation with uh, Kistler randomization. So my student Jorge Munoz uh, proved that if T admits universal column sort, then so does this Kistler randomization. So for in particular, if T is a non aleph not categorical Boolean theory, then TR is a non aleph not categorical continuous theory that still admits a universal column sort. And he, he gave an explicit construction. Okay, but still, it's not good enough. Okay, there exist theories which do not admit such a sort. I gave you an example, it's not very important. Just, it doesn't cover all cases. Okay, and this yeah, was. Still, still, can you, since you wrote it, can you say what is the unary identity predicate and what is the zero one distance? Well, he, uh, the unit identity, identity predicate is a map from the interval zero one to the interval zero one that sends oh. alpha to alpha. Okay, and the zero one distance? The distance is either zero or one according to whether you're equal or not. The, I see, okay, thanks. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of, it's a distance from classical, from Boolean law, it's a Boolean distance 
uh, and uh, yeah. continuous. Okay, it, it mixes things in a bad way. Okay, so let's go back. So, so basically, what I want to talk about. So somehow, the thing referred to in in the in the title uh, is is what I'm going to get to now. So, what was the problem? So again, if I have a formula and I know that there exist witnesses that take it arbitrarily close to zero regardless of X, well, then I said that the set where it actually easier need not be definable. And in addition, the projection on the first coordinate need not be onto. Uh, I guess uh, I'm not going to tell you what I mean by define by not definable, I'm going to tell you what I mean by is definable and you, okay. So let's see, how do I solve this? First of all, I solve the thing about, the easy one is the projection. I mean, why is it not onto? Because maybe there are y's for any given, maybe for a given a, there are b's such that this is arbitrarily small, but not necessarily zero. So you know what? Allow an error. Okay, instead of you want it to be zero, you want it to be less than one, less or equal. I want things to be close, to be compact in the end. Okay, that's fine, but it's still not going to be definable. Okay, so now let's go a step further and allow a variable error. So now I'm going to consider all triplets, R, A, B, where R is a real number, and I want phi A, B to be less or equal than R. Now this is definable. So why is this definable? And then figure out why, what fails earlier. So basically there are two ways of being close to D. One of them is logically, you are not in D, but the condition that defines D is almost satisfied. So phi A, B is not less or equal to R, but it's almost less or equal to R for very small epsilon, it's very small error, additional error. Well, in that case, it actually, the triplet is actually metrically very close to an actual member of D. For example, just replace R with R plus epsilon, this belongs to D, and the distance between this triplet and that triplet is small. Okay, so being definable is exactly this, is when in order to be close to an actual member of D, it suffices, it suffices to be just almost, to almost satisfy the condition that defines D. Uh, and, and, and all the previous sets did not satisfy this, this property. Okay, but now there is a funny problem here because if I want this to work, I must always allow to take R and increase it a bit and then maybe increase it some more and may, then maybe increase it some more. So kind of necessarily, uh, well, then for compactness, the supremum has to be also attained and so at some point I just reach infinity. And when I reach infinity, well, the condition is meaningless and it's not going to code me a model because I'm just not asking for anything. So how do I get out of this? Okay, so this goes back to my question toward earlier about uh, Palo Alto. So um, maybe you will tell me later what if you can recall why you were talking about this, but it was, okay, it was Ward who, I mean, once I kind of, okay, did this, I realized that it was something that Ward has spoken to me at that time, very early time of continuous logic. Don't remember why, but at some point he was very um, interested in, okay, it's, it's not actually a suspension, because it's, it's not a suspension, because especially when you pinch two points, I just want to pinch one point. It's a con basically, take X, multiplied by the interval, okay? So you have X and then multiplied by the interval and then you pinch all these things and now you get something like that. Think of it as a star, you have a center point and then rays that go out. You, you want me to answer the question? Yes, but during the question it's a session. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and so we, we identify, so all these points here, I, I call them, I call them, I call them, uh, uh, well, yes, that's, this is, this I call zero, the origin, the root, some people call it the root, call it zero. Um, okay, so now say you have a sequence of formulas, rich in some sense, forget, and just, okay, formulas kind of occur densely, okay, just a rich sequence of formulas that satisfy this 
uh, there exists a witness condition. And now I'm going to define a set, a funny set, not, in, not a set of sequences, but a set of, in, in the cone of sequences. And how do I do that? I tell you, so alpha comma, so alpha is a real in the interval and A is an infinite sequence and it belongs to this funny set. If uh, each time uh, the error is less or equal than to, well, originally I wrote here one over A, actually usually I should write one over alpha to be honest. I just added this N, it, the N actually doesn't change anything whatsoever. I just added, I, I'll tell you later why I added it, but okay. So, doesn't matter. Um, and so if I want to increase the allowable error, all I need to do is decrease alpha. Okay, kind of change the direction. But again, alpha might go all the way to zero, which means the error goes all the way up to infinity. So you don't avoid that. But then you only have, at zero, you only have one point. So let's sum things up. So first of all, it's an indefinable set. Basically the same argument I gave earlier, you can always increase the allowable error a little. And so if you almost satisfy the condition, you actually, you can change the allowable error. And now you do satisfy the condition and you didn't change anything by much. If you have a point where alpha is strictly positive, so you, have, you are requiring a finite error one over alpha, maybe very big, but then this thing is going to code them all. That's why I put the N here, because basically it tells you that if you go far enough, you're going to find your witnesses. Arbit you're going to find arbitrarily good witnesses. But it's actually true also without, the N doesn't change anything, but just put it so it, it looks more obvious. Okay, that's it. Okay, so DCL of this thing is going to be the DCL of a model and every model is a DCL of such a guy. And there is a unique root. Now this root, doesn't call anything. It's, it's, it's definable, it's indefinable closure of the empty set. Okay. So that's how you get around it. You, you allow infinite error, but then it's, it's a distinguished point that actually doesn't call the model and, and, and you're home free. Okay. So can we call the definition? I, I just repeat the definition. So you always require the, uh, you have the sequences and uh, each one is a witness up to an error that depends on where you are in the, at the height of, of in the cone. And this set, you, you prove that this set is unique. It's definable, it's unique, up to definable bijection. So if you have two sufficiently rich set if sequences five, I'm not going to say what I mean by that, then you get the same thing. And the groupoid that you get is a complete by interpretation invariant for T. So G uh, star of T, namely, let's call it G star. No, I just put stars everywhere because I think of these things as stars. So G, the groupoid associated to this definable set. So again, same thing. All types of two codes that code the same model or are both the zero element. That's also a possibility. So what is the basis of this guy? Well, it's again, it's a set of types in this set D star. Okay. And the same argument that tells you that, um, okay, so that's the Lelet fan. So that's how the, I, okay. So maybe let me remind you, of course, you know, but let me remind you what the Lelet fan is. So, a fan is a connected subset of the, okay, just take the cone over the Cantor set. It's like, can I just mention it should come to an end fairly soon, please? What? Sorry, well, I, I cannot, the, Dougal, it's Dougal's voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just finish fairly soon, please. The, well, I, I can't hear. Sorry? <laughs> this is what you wanted. Just tell him. Uh, no, no, you should come to an end fairly soon. Um, oh, I can't. Oh, oh, sorry. I can't. I thought I still had 10 minutes. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. I'll. I have this in one other slide. So. Uh, okay. It's come to an end soon. Okay. I, I can hear you. Okay. Um, quickly. Okay. 
just a lelic fan is a subset of this guy. Well, so you have these things kind of go different direction, I mean, different lengths, and the short one. So you have all these endpoints. And it's a lelic fan if all these endpoints are dense. In that set, and the and, and the Lelic fan is uh, is unique up to homomorphism. Okay, let's just keep it at that. So it's a, it's a very nice compact space. Okay, so let me just because I gave you three constructions, uh, let me just sum, summarize them very quickly and, and say one last thing about them. Um, so okay, so we had three hypotheses that are somehow increasingly general. First was Aleph not categorical. Okay, or it implies that the universal scholarly sort exists. And of course, there is a fully general case. In the first case, we constructed a group uh, based in, which is the same thing as constructing the group weight based on the complete type of a model. <coughs> uh, then of course, since th this is a complete type, uh, there is only one type in a complete type. So the basis is the point. In the other case, so I had this weird uh, universal column sort I never defined in the space of types in that set is the kind of space. And then I had a general case where I constructed this more uh, sort of fan of codes of models and its space of types is the Lalek fan. And the reconstruction of T is always the same in the sense that you kind of recover the theory of this definable set in each case. And in that definable set with all the induced structure, you can interpret T. And of course you can also interpret it in T, so thereby interpret I mean, okay. So let me just say one last thing about the relations between uh, these constructions. So it's not only that the conditions imply one another, but these are actual, I mean, if, if you are Aleph not categorical, then I already told you how to construct the universal column sort. Uh, just, okay, so I already said that, so let's skip this. If you have a universal scholar sort, I can tell you how to construct D star. Just take the scholar, your uh, scholar sort, multiply it by, by the Lelec fan, and again, identif identify all points at the root, and you get your D star. So each case actually is a generalization of the other. It's not just uh, a, um, how to say this? It's, it's really one included in, in the second, included in the third, and you can explicitly recover in each case the groupoid of your case from the groupoid of the previous case if you also hold the condition of the previous case. And maybe I guess one last remark uh, regarding various uh, questions that I was asked last time I spoke about the similar topic. These groupoids are, as far as I understand, very, very different from those that arise uh, from categorical logic involving spectral spaces and um, uncountable. Okay, okay, I'm not going to, to talk about that. I don't have time. So, but they are very. These constructions are quite quite different, and they contain different information. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Doc. <laughs> There's time for one quick question. <clears throat> 